democracy nation that's able to bully other nations into getting what they want. We've had to do what we've been doing over the years, taking exceptional risks, because one of the things I do ask my crew, are you willing to die for a whale? Are you willing to risk your life for a whale? And if they say no, we don't take them. And when people say that's asking an awful lot, to ask people to risk their life to protect an animal. And I said, well, you know, I don't understand that. In our world, we ask people to risk their lives, people die, and we kill for oil wells or for real estate. I think it's a far more noble endeavor to risk your life to protect an endangered species or a threatened habitat. And it really comes down to what our values are. One of the things that I've found over the years that uh, is required really to do what we do is to have an immunity to criticism. And quite frankly, I don't really care what people think about what we do out there. And I'll tell you why. My life was changed back in 1975 when I was first mate on the Greenpeace voyage to protect the whales. And uh, we had come up with this idea to save whales. We were reading a lot of Gandhi at the time. We thought all we had to do was put ourselves between the harpoon and the whales, and nobody would risk killing a human being to, to kill a whale. And so in 1975, in June, Bob Hunter and I found ourselves in a small little rubber boat in front of a Soviet harpoon vessel, only 60 miles off the northern coast of California, this before the 200-mile limit, and in front of us, eight magnificent sperm whales that were fleeing for their life. And every time the uh, harpooner tried to get a shot, I would maneuver my boat and block his path. And this worked for about 25 minutes until the captain on the Soviet vessel came down the catwalk. He screamed into the ear of the, uh, of the harpooner. He looked at us and he smiled and brought his finger across his throat. And that's when we realized Gandhi wasn't going to work for us that day. A few moments later, there was this incredible explosion, and the harpoon flew over our head and slammed into the backside of one of the whales in front of us. It was a female, and she screamed. It was like a woman's scream. It was very eerie, and she rolled on her side in a, a fountain of blood, and suddenly the largest whale in the pod slammed the water with his tail and disappeared. And he swam right underneath of us and threw himself out of the water, hurled himself straight at the harpooner on the Soviet vessel to protect his pod, to protect his kind. But they were ready for him with an unattached harpoon, and he very nonchalantly pulled the trigger and sent a second harpoon point blank into this whale's head, and it exploded, and the whale fell back in the water, screaming in agony, rolling on the surface. And as he rolled about on the surface, I caught his eye, and he looked at me, and he dove. And I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming at us real fast. And this whale came up and out of the water at an angle so that the next move was just to simply fall forward on top of us and crush us. And as his head rose up out of the water, and I saw this eye come out from the ocean, and I looked into that eye, I saw something in that eye that changed my life forever because I saw understanding. That whale understood what we were trying to do because I could see the effort that the whale made to pull himself back. I could see his muscles clench. He pulled himself back, and his head began to slip back into the sea, and I saw his eye disappear beneath the surface, and he died. He could have killed us, and he made the decision not to do so. So the fact that I'm alive today is because that whale made that decision. So I owe my, my life to that whale. But I saw something else in that eye, something that really had a profound impact on me. And it was pity, not for himself, but for us, that we could commit such an act of blasphemy, that we could take life so thoughtlessly, so ruthlessly, so mercilessly, and for what? The Russians were killing sperm whales primarily for spermaceti oil. And one of the uses for spermaceti oil was for lubricating machinery. It's a very high heat-resistant oil. And one of the pieces of machinery that were being manufactured by the Russians with spermaceti oil were intercontinental ballistic missiles. I said, here we are, destroying this incredibly intelligent, socially complex, beautiful sentient creature for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it struck me. We're insane. And from that moment on, I said, I'm not going to do this for people. I'm going to do this for them, for the whales, for the creatures of the sea. And that's what we've been doing ever since. In 1986, we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet at Dockside and destroyed their whale processing plant. And there was a $10 million hit on their industry that took them 17 years to recover from. And after that, 
a former colleague from Greenpeace came up and he said, I just want to let you know that what you did in Iceland was despicable, reprehensible, and unforgivable. And you're an embarrassment to this movement. And I said, so? <laughs> we didn't sink those whaling ships for you or for the movement or for any human being on the planet. But John, find me one whale in the ocean, anywhere, that disagreed with what we did, and I promise we won't do it again. <laughs> they are our clients. They are who we represent. But I have to point out that in all of the years of doing this, we've not been convicted of any crimes. Now, that might sound like a serious crime, to sink half a whaling fleet. I had to fly to Reykjavik to demand to be arrested. And uh, the next day, they escorted me to the airport, put me on a plane, and the Minister of Justice stood up in Parliament and says, who does he think he is? He comes into our country and demands to be arrested. Get him out of here. They knew that to put me on trial would be to put Iceland on trial. And that's the last thing they, place they wanted to go, is into that court. Because we intervene against illegal activities. That's what we do. Last year, I gave a lecture at the FBI Academy in Quantico, and one of the FBI agents said, you know, Sea Shepherd's walking a pretty damn fine line when it comes to the law. And my answer was, who cares how fine it is as long as you don't cross it? And they had to agree. But they said, you know, we've had over 4,500 volunteers in our organization. Some of your people have gone on and committed eco-crimes. I said, yeah, well, what's that got to do with me? You trained them. You're responsible. I said, I got three names for you. Timothy McVeigh, Lee Harvey Oswell, and Osama bin Laden. You trained them. You're responsible. <laughs> the fact is, is that, uh, you know, we get called a lot of things. I get called an eco-terrorist a lot. Nobody's got any warrants out for my arrest, but I'm still called an eco-terrorist. But, you know, in a world where the Dalai Lama is officially a terrorist, I don't mind being one. <laughs> it's a, just a lot of name-calling, really, when you come down to it. But when they started to call us pirates, I said, oh, well, that sounds real good. I like that. And so we adopted our own Jolly Roger, and we have our ships are black. We try to be as intimidating as possible. Because it takes me back to the 17th century when piracy was out of control in the Caribbean. The British Navy wasn't doing much about it because there's too much money being taken under the table, uh, being made from piracy. And so piracy flourished until one man, Henry Morgan, came along and shot.